I don't think I've ever seen a hybrid panel discussion. So let's see how this will work. Um, so would it be possible to have the panelists, the speakers up, all of the pictures, or is that difficult? Hey, I see Kun, that's great. And I know Elias is there, I see him as well. And Uri, okay, perfect. And Frederick is here in front of us. Okay, that already looks like a real panel. Um, oh no, I see them, but oh yeah, perfect. Yay, good, great. Okay, um, you should take a microphone, yes. And I will be running around. I mean, they should hear you guys if you're talking, but it might be better, or I can also repeat the question and I'll try to run around as well. Okay, so with this, um, let's just get started. So I want to first just open it up for everyone um, if there were questions to any of the speakers. Um, and then also, of course, if there are questions like more general. Um, so let's get started over here and I'll be running. So this quest question is for the first talk, <coughs> out of Frederick. Um, so there were a sequence of measures by information theorists called hypercontractivity measures. So if you look at them, one way of looking at it is through the information bottleneck principle. So if you have two variables, X and Y, you can coarse grain X into U and you look at maximizing the mutual information between the coarse grained U and Y divided by the mutual information between the coarse grained and X. That division is important. And it turns out it satisfies what is called Rennie's axioms. So there were five or six axioms that Rennie proposed long ago for the for an unnormalized, sorry, normalized correlation measure. And it turns out it also has some directional properties. So I was just wondering why go with the mutual information because it's known to be an unnormalized measure. So what do I mean by that? If you reduce noise between X and Y gradually, essentially what happens in continuous spaces the mutual information blows up. So it's not normalized between zero and one. So between two situations, you don't really know whether this effect is more compared to another effect or not. But if you look at these Rennie correlation based measures, uh, hypercontractivity is one, uh, it basically normalizes the measure. So I was wondering when you're coarse graining, does such considerations play an important role? Have you looked at any of these alternate measures from information? So I don't know those measures, so I would have to have a look at this. But remember, I was not presenting my story on this. I was uh, criticizing another one that used mutual information. So um, I, I, I don't have anything to say about those other measures. And um, I think the reason for using mutual information in this case is only because of the connection to channel capacity. Um, but as I try to indicate in my talk, I don't think it's the right way to go. So I take your your references as an encouragement to look somewhere else. Yeah. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you all. Hello. Um, Firstly, thank you all for some very nice talks. Uh, I had a, a question for the last speaker, Uri. Um, so you give this distinction between offline data where you observe a partial part of that vector X and online data where you observe the full vector X. And I was trying to think of, uh, if you could help give me some um, intuition for when that will show up because presumably offline data is collected from previous online trajectories. So when, how, how does such asymmetry show up in the real world? Um, so two examples, actually I actually have three examples. One, if, if, the online, if the offline data is from humans, humans just perceive differently than machines. Uh, they, they didn't see exactly what the, the automatic driver sees. Uh, that's one. A second might be privacy concerns. You might have demographic data or sensitive data that you may not use. A third, which is surprising, but turns out to be true, at least from my discussions with people, for example, at Google, they run contextual bandits or things that are like complicated versions of contextual bandits. Uh, so essentially, they should have all of X, right? Because they ran it in the, his, in, you know, last year they ran it, so they should have all the data. They do not necessarily have all the data. Uh, they might not have the entire X or the policy uh, that was used historically in their own setting it turns out it's a much more complicated problem than we in academia might uh, have appreciated. 
questions? So follow up to that question. Uh, so you considered a case where in the offline part, the context, a part of the context is not observable, but in the online case, that part is actually observable. So my question is, is there an example where it would make sense to have in both cases, uh, that part being not observable? Like even in the online case, the context that influenced your reward is still not available for the online agent. Um, yeah, and it could have been available to the offline one. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, that could be, so it, it so online, it will not affect our actions, right? But it might still affect the reward and the transition. Yeah. And yes, that, that is an interesting scenario that we have not yet looked into. So maybe I'll, I'll ask also something for um, Kuhn and Elias in both of your talks. Of course, Kuhn, ha you had like some, you know, if you make some very weak parametric assumptions, you're telling us how much more you can actually learn. Elias, you're taking a completely non-parametric approach. Um, so what, you know, where would you see like a middle ground between the two and how much more could actually be said maybe also for these transport formulas if you're taking a slightly parametric approach, like maybe ruling out some distributions? For any of you. Yes, oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, yes, give me a minute. So uh, basically, uh, you can see I also consider non completely non-parametric case. Uh, it's because in many situations, actually the information in the data is strong enough so that you can just drop the parametric assumptions. For instance, in time series, right? Uh, let's consider a classical scenario. If you consider, if you want to estimate time delayed correlations uh, from time series, then clearly, right, it's, it's nothing but dependence. From dependence, you can immediately find a representation. So in many cases, we have such side information so that we can completely recover the representation without making use of parameter assumption. However, uh, if you do not have time information or um, distribution shift information, very often time that we can benefit from the uh, additional assumptions, which imply the independent change condition or which imply the identifiability because of the independent change property. And I believe that, um, Oh, I should stop here. Elias, you go first. I'm, I'm, you, you went first, but thanks. <laughs> hey, Kwon. The Thank you, Caroline, for your question. I want just to make a comment about the, the previous one. Uh, I don't know who asked that. If it was Kartik, it sounds like his voice. But yeah, of course, we can have uh, experimental data uh, in which you don't have some, if I understood correctly, that you don't observe co some covariates. Any, any two robots that have different set of sensors, they may, do, maybe, they may be doing experiments in the environment and they have access to a different set of covariates and may be affected even by this set of covariates. And I think it's a natural scenario, kind of very interesting. Now about Caroline's uh, question about the maybe the tension between parametric and non-parametric, uh, I think my, my feeling is like, I, I always would try to, I think it's a spectrum, right? And I always would try to start from the non-parametric side, given that it's less committal and, uh, and we may be introducing less of our own biases or beliefs that may be wrong. And then if you get a negative result in terms of identification or learning of the causal diagram or identification of a transport formula, then maybe you can kind of keep moving in the spectrum and, and, and see what assumptions could be sensible and, and see if you can get identification, uh, identifiability. But yeah, thanks for the question, Caroline. <clears throat> thanks to both of you. Let me maybe ask again, maybe more, and please also uh, feel free to raise your hand and Dominic will be going around. Um, maybe for um, Frederick and, um, um, and of course Kuhn, right? You both had about causal representation learning at very different kinds of talks. And I think I asked it at the end. And, you know, I think also Kuhn's example, he mentioned one about the questionnaires and about um, the state of mind or something, which would be a overarching variable, which might be slightly different than a coarsening. Um, but still in the coarsening, you also don't have somehow because there you don't really have directed edges, right? You have these constituent um, relationships, but how, in which cases would the two be similar? 
Um, and also how would the two assumptions that you make, one is a minimality assumption and one is which you're criticizing, but still is an assumption, this effective, uh, this maximizing effective information, when would they somehow lead to similar kinds of um, latent causal variables? And when would they be very different? Uh, Frederick points to Kuhn. So and Kuhn <laughs> points back to Frederick. So you guys figure it out. <laughs> Kuhn, do you want to start? I want to listen to Frederick. So Frederick, please. I would like to listen to you. Well, <laughs> I might be the source of the feedback, so I'm just warning you uh, with it, but it seems to be okay now. Um, so I think the difference of the kind of setup that I was looking at uh, to the one that Kuhn was looking at is that um, there are causal relations from the um, macro variables or from the latent variables in Kuhn case, Kuhn's case to indicators that we actually measure, whereas the setting that I was looking at was that the the macro variable was constitutive of the, uh, the measurements that we have, or was, was a, di a direct function of it. It was not that the pixel values were caused by um, the underlying phenomenon, but that uh, uh, they were constitutive of the underlying phenomenon. So um, now we have to ask ourselves, I think both of those settings are very reasonable settings in psychometric circumstances, like the example that Kuhn was giving, um, we have questionnaires, and there it seems that the kinds of questions that uh, uh, subjects are be answering are indicators that are causal effects, perhaps, of some underlying mental state of depression or anxiety or of whatever the ones were in, in Kuhn's setting. Um, whereas in cases where we want to say it's a feature of an image such that you recognize a face, then it seems like the pixel values are constitutive of the, the uh, face that's in the image, right? And so now the question is where, where do we use uh, each of these? And I think it will depend on the different settings, uh, which one is appropriate and where they can um, both be applied. So now to Caroline's question about when do they give, despite their different nature, quite different, uh, sorry, is very similar results. Um, I think that's uh, quite hard to, to say precisely. Um, my guess would be uh, to, to look at cases where, of course, the causal relations then look very much like constitutive relations. So in particular, if the causal relations in Kuhn's setting become very close to deterministic or something like that, then that is certainly a case where I think that, that it doesn't really matter uh, which one of those uh, approaches we use. But I actually think this is a really good question, and I don't know a general answer for it. Kuhn. What do you think? Thank you very much. So I have, uh, I agree with the, um, everything you just said. Let me just quickly add two points. First of all, um, from my perspective, I would like to find the hidden causal variables, right, according to the formulation. So, and the second of all, how, uh, by the way, here we would like to distinguish between causal representation learning and some, um, and another uh, set of approaches trying to find a compact compact representation of the causal relations, right? You want to find a collection of variable, the functional collection variable, so that you can have a simpler uh, description of the relations. And this is the one difference. And the second one is that uh, although we have the causal latent causal variables, we have a causal picture in practice, we have to do inference. Right, and the inference procedure basically is trying to derive a function of the measured variables to capture the information of the latent variable. And now you can see, if you care about the inference procedure or if you focus on the inference procedure, then the two things will basically convert in some way. And that's also the reason why in some situations it's really hard to distinguish between the two settings. Okay, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you questions in the audience they will be asked now uh, th this is a question for Kuhn uh, so there's this existing literature on identifiable VAEs that relies on uh, this auxiliary information that's often given by some temporally ordered data I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, like comparing and contrasting your approaches to, to that existing literature and how they might be related to each other Oh, that's a great question. So first of all, actually, identifiable VAE is just an extension of nonlinear CA method I mentioned, right? 
So this uh, by incorporating uh, noise, right? You can just have the BAE framework, uh, but still the underlying independent variables or the latent variables, latent representation are identifiable. So this is the first thing is basic. It was mentioned in my talk. It's fundamental. And the second of all, in many cases, uh, we cannot find the independent variables, latent variables. Remember the last uh, scenario we considered, uh, suppose what we observed, XIs, right? The main variable that was generated by latent variables with changing causal relations, right? Z1 causes Z2, but this causal influence may change across domains over time. In this case, we can never apply a fixed transformation to the measured variables to produce independent variables. In this case, you have to find the causally disentangled latent variables with causal relations in order to recover the truth, to make sure that oh, what you recover is consistent with the, with the causal process. So the short answer is that in some cases, yes, uh, identify with BIE or the original version of nonlinear CA would be very useful. But in some situations, uh, you can see that you have to go beyond that because you have to incorporate the causal interactions, especially time uh, changing causal interactions uh, among the latent variables. Is that answer to your question? Yes. Also, please, all the panelists, feel free to add, of course, always to any of these questions. Otherwise, I see another question there. I, I had a question about oh. the first. Uh, I had a question about the first talk. Um, so you mentioned it was a critique of this uh, this uh, work on on finding the right course name. What do you think is the like key? Pro, like, do you think the goal is the thing that's impossible and we just like no such coarsening exists or is it more about as the assumption on the intervention distribution that's the problem? No, okay, good, great question. So so I, I didn't give you the positive story obviously uh, uh, this morning. So uh, I think I, I obviously don't think uh, the goal is impossible because otherwise that would spell bad news for the life sciences or any sort of higher order uh, uh, um, causal claim that we might make in economics and psychology and in, in biology, uh, anything like that. So uh, I, I think the approach is, is uh, starting from wrong assumptions um, in, in this framework. I don't think it's only the maximum entropy uh, um, distribution that is the problem. For, in some sense, the moment I see a maximum entropy distribution go into anything, the alarm bells go off for me because I think that's a very, very specific setting that you're then using and you're fixing things in a very, uh, um, you're pretending to, to do it without any sort of background or, or uh, uh, putting in any information. But in fact, I think you're fixing the system in an enormous way. Um, so that is one problem in this, this uh, model. But I think the other problem is actually uh, the notion of the intervention on the macro variable being a sum of the uh, uh, intervention effects of the micro level uh, values that map to that macro level value. So, and there, uh, Eric Hole uses, uses just a, again, a uniform distribution, but it doesn't really matter to me what the distribution is there. I think in all cases, that's a bad idea. When I set the temperature in this room to 80 Fahrenheit, I'm setting it to a specific microscopic state value, right? I might not know which one it is, but I'm setting it to a specific one. I'm not setting it to an average of a whole bunch of uh, values. So I think this sort of question of how do we instantiate the macro level intervention at the micro level? How do we understand this sort of choice of uh, micro level distribution that is picked given the macro level setting is one that we need to think about very carefully. And I think that has been glossed over in this, this account and it's nothing to do with maximum entropy. So that's why ultimately I think we have to think about using the conditional distribution so of the effect given the intervention on given the intervention on the cause to look at those to start coarsening and to do it perhaps in that space. And so I have a story to tell on that one, but so that I don't think is, is you know, there are other approaches that also do that. And, those I think are very interesting and don't fall into these sorts of traps. Oh, I, sorry, uh, Karen, can I quickly interrupt? Okay. So I forgot to mention, one, okay, uh, just two sentences. 
uh, regarding previous, I mentioned the situation where the latent variable has, uh, have changing correlations. In this case, you cannot use independence-based method. In addition, even if the color model over the latent variable and the measure variable is fixed, very oftentimes we have to recover the true variables because they are simpler. Again, we cannot just assume latent variable always independent. Stop. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kun. So another question for Frederick. Um, so, so I found your cr criticisms convincing, but I have a very basic question about the setting, which is uh, uh, what exactly is the, the problem that these meta, these macro variables are meant to solve? I guess like from a, say, decision theoretic perspective, I would maybe expect there'd be some sort of criterion that they're gonna be used in some way. I can introduce a utility and then I can ask, okay, what are the best macro variables to introduce? That'd be like maybe my naive approach to it. Maybe I just don't know the context and literature, but maybe you can fill me in on like, what is the problem being well, solved? Well, one thing just in, in uh, uh, as a slogan, we are, if you don't think that there is some sort of macro variable representation that we should be learning, then we should all be doing quantum mechanics, right? So in some sense, it's a justification of looking at higher order sciences as an independent source, independently, uh, that higher order sciences can study causal relations in their own right at their level, right, at their level of aggregation, without having to worry about what exactly the micro level instantiation is. So there's a question in the sense about reductionism in the sciences, so whether we can build that sort of thing. Now, your, your point about, well, shouldn't we just put in some utilities about what sort of thing I want to, uh, you know, affect, and then um, given those utilities, uh, and, and the outcomes that I can get, I uh, uh, should aggregate according to those. Maybe, maybe that's the approach. I think that's a possibility, but that presumes two things. One is that it is indeed possible to arbitrarily aggregate just on the basis of some sort of utility. Um, and I think there's an alternative view where you might say, look, what we're engaged in in the sciences is to give some objective description of what the world is like that is independent of what exactly my own utilities are. And uh, then the question is, can we describe, can we provide such an objective description of the world uh, um, given that some sort of aggregation procedure? And I think it's a legitimate view to say that no, any sort of macro level description, any causal model in economics is ultimately just about the utilities and things that we're interested in. I think there's an alternative to say that no, there are objective facts to the matter of whether inequality uh, um, is caused by some particular uh, um, inflation, say, um, or whether that those are not objective causal quantities. Never mind what your utilities are about those. Right? So that's that's the goal: is to somehow provide some independent justification about causal claims at higher level sciences. Obviously, the model was extraordinarily simplified. Never mind that. Yeah. This is Hassan. Um, so this is building on actually the previous question, which is also how does this work in the reverse direction? So in a lot of these applications, you have this situation where you don't really get to choose that constitutive relation. You just have some data on some macro level thing. And is there any way without being able to observe the micro um, data to have a sense of sort of um, how uh, strong your, well, I mean, you, you mentioned there are several problems with this, um, with how the paper did it, but assuming that you had something that worked really nicely, would there be some sort of approach to kind of estimate how strong your macro data is causal relations? Yeah, I think I think this is a great question. So I I think if we can give a coherent story of this sort of aggregation, then we might be able to tell that the data that we've collected is at the wrong level of granularity, right? That it's too coarse already. So now the question is, what are the indicators that my data 
uh, that my level of measurement and my level of representation is actually too coarse and that I should be refining. I think that's the kind of question you're asking. You're saying, like, look, going bottom up seems easy. You know, I don't, we didn't hear a positive story today, but, you know, maybe there is one. But what about going the other way? Right. And I think that's, that's in order to tell what sort of errors or, in, uh, or, or problems um, we should be searching for in our data to then say, no, we need to refine uh, uh, our measurement. We need to have a coherent story of how we think the whole system aggregates. Right? And so um, I think that's a big open problem. I think we have anecdotal cases of actually there's some reason to think that the total cholesterol case that we now think of HDL and LDL as important constituents is something that people saw these sorts of ambiguous distributions in the effects of total cholesterol. You and your lab did your total cholesterol experiment, I did mine in my lab, and then there were different results and distributions in the effect. Why? Because maybe we had different uh, levels of HDL versus LDL, right? And so that gives an indication that we should refine. Now, I think the kinds of indicators are not well understood yet, but I, that would be nice to know. So I, I do consider that part of the goal of this sort of research project. Yeah. So this is definitely a uh, discussion that can continue over lunch, maybe just also for the virtual speaker. So let's do just another couple, two minutes and so, and then we should end it. Um, so, you know, I want to just connect it by uh, Uri's talk and Elias talk. Um, so Uri, you had your, if I understood it correctly, right, the action space was all discrete. Now, of course, often you have, say, a drug and a dose of a drug is in a, in a you know, continuous space. And also, if we go even a step further um, for what Elias presented on soft interventions, what about if we actually do take these actions to be soft interventions that could, for example, be stochastic, as Elias had presented? Um, how would you go about actually adding, you know, being actions, being an intervention, being something causal? Um, maybe you have to take a model-based RL um, setting, or how would you actually integrate that? And maybe also a question for Elias as well. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We're actually we're working now on on a continuous interventions, but in in a simpler setting, not not in a reinforcement learning setting. Um, yeah, and it's hard. Uh, you have to make some some extra assumptions uh, for this uh, to work. You, you need some model or some continuity or something uh, about soft interventions. So. Actually, there's there's these couple of results about like stochastic policies that there sometimes you don't sometimes the optimal policy you know is deterministic, right? There's a bunch of classic results in RL, which I'm not actually I'm not kind of fully I don't remember the details that say sometimes you don't have to consider uh, stochastic interventions. Uh, however, if we're talking about RL online with continuous actions, uh, yeah, that that seems uh, hard. Uh, though I have to say, even the robot we did, the action space was essentially continuous, right? You have like these joints, uh, but there's just all these methods people develop, like very applied, like how to discretize it to make this actually work in practice. I have to say, this is stuff I like, guy, the, the PhD student, he, he knows this stuff much better than me, how to make it work in practice. Uh, he also knows the theory, but, uh, yeah, our, our theory, for example, for bandits with continuous actions, I don't know what's the theory even just for online. I, I, I wonder if, if other people here know, like for continuous actions, just in standard contextual bandits, that seems like a hard problem to me. And I don't know what's kind of, what results exist. Maybe so, someone here on the panel or in the crowd uh, would know better than I do. I think we're nearly up Elias, do you want to add something? And then this will be the last <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah, I would just I'm not I'm not sure if we want to end in this note, but yeah, the continuous is very very tough. Uh, if if it's continuous outcome, uh, I think we can do almost not, not assumption free, but quite mild kind of set of assumptions. If it's continuous actions, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with results of this kind. But what he said is a little bit of a maybe a hack, but we kind of discretize. But it may it may make sense, uh, uh, given that you anyhow in some settings may it may make sense um, uh, to have it fully non quote unquote non parametric. But I think most of the results that we're discussing, I think Uri as well, is kind of leveraging or, or, or some type of bounding 
of the distributions that you use from the offline data and incorporate in the online data. Then in, to be honest, in the last one year, maybe is the one that we are learning the results for the discrete case. It took maybe 20 or 25 years since the first result by Bauke and Pro or, or even before uh, in Econometrics by Mansky. And uh, then continues, I think is, is still work to be done perhaps for the folks there at the time, the Simons, they can help us with these questions. Great. So I think with this, thank you all so much. I think it's great to uh, end with open questions um, for us to all work on and directions to actually take on. So with this, um, we'll end the panel discussion here. We have a break until 2.30. Um, so we'll all be back here at 2.30 and then we'll have two more talks and again, a panel discussion. So see you all back in the afternoon and have a great lunch. Um, you know, there are people here who are local. You can follow them around um, to find a lunch place to go to. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Bean. Panelists for wonderful talks.